tradition, tradition. From generation to generation, passing on the time-honored ways. Family customs, holiday celebrations, treasured recipes. Gefilte fish, chicken soup and matzo balls, brisket, rye bread and apple strudel, all made just the way grandma used to make them. Tradition, tradition. Sooner or later, ingenuity sparks ideas and new traditions are born. Take my inventive and tireless friend, Eli Zabar. The youngest son of New York's renowned Deli family, Eli has been rethinking tradition all his professional life. When I got out of school and was starting my career, Zabar's was still a very small business. And so I went off to do my own work and thing. And I had a concept uh, myself I, of uh, my own idea was, was to, to grow from that. To, to take my origins and to take uh, my love of Italian and, and French food and, and markets and start, start doing something new or something, something else, not new, but something else. Upstairs in the vinegar factory's kitchen, Chef Nancy Hart has created a variation on an old theme. She turns kasha a humble dish of buckwheat groats into a vibrant main course. Nancy, tell me honestly, what is all this chazarai out here? <laughs> well, we have an eggplant, which we've roasted. Uh, we're going to show everybody how to take sliced tomatoes and roast them in the oven. Do you have always, an eggplant caviar good. dish in your book? I sure do. God, that's my favorite it's thing in the world. Crazy. I love that. I love eggplant caviar. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> Eggplants are really easy. I, you just throw them on a flat top if you have it, or you can just put them right on the flame, brown them off so they're nice and charcoal -y, the better. Lots yeah. of flavor as added. Finish them in the oven so they're really tender. And you can just peel the skin off. Right. I make my, my caviar dish. I like to add a little of the skin back in. It gives it a very nice flavor. flavor. Yeah. We always end up with some flecks in there, which gives it a really nice charcoal-y. Uh -huh. <laughs> And you know what? If you, you know what I found? If you use little baby eggplant, the okay. Italian ones, you know, right. little baby or the, Italian, or the Japanese, the, the little Italian <laughs> ones. Those you are know, my favorite. You know what you find? I find that it stays a long time in the refrigerator, a week or two. I find that if I use these really big ones, you know, these ones out of Kansas or wherever they're from, that that <laughs> they, they begin to ferment, and 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 um, uh, the, the the thing spoils after a day or two. The smaller ones have less seeds. Yeah, yeah. And it's a nice ratio. All right, so. Okay, so the tomatoes, um, we're going to roast those. Um, I'm just going to add a little oil. What kind of oil do you use? Um, it's canola oil, vegetable oil, and some salt, kosher salt. We, we cook with exclusively kosher salt in our kitchen. We just like the way it tastes better. Okay. How come and you didn't ask me about, like, you know, my growing up in vegetables? Did you, you did, eat any you, vegetables? Well, you know, like, at all, I can't say I really did. Uh, you know. <laughs> Well, you were Eastern I think, European, right? I think every mother was trying to force uh, some something vegetables or something, you. yeah. But we didn't, we didn't yeah. eat very, very So when many. did you start eating vegetables? You know, actually, I started eating vegetables when I met Nancy and Keith. Yeah? And, and really, uh, which was only, you know, <laughs> and my wife, you know. And beans I, and grains. Yeah, right. I'm still basically a meat and potatoes man. When I came here, they said, okay, we really want to do some nice things with grains and beans, but Eli doesn't like them. But you have to make the stuff he likes. It has to be really yummy and lots of flavor, but he doesn't really like them. So you got to really do a good job. This may be one of the you know, few dishes that we, that we make that doesn't have butter in it. <laughs> right. So we're just going to roast those in the oven. Right? It takes, it takes a long time till the liquid is absorbed, and they've got lots of color, and they're crispy, and they're yummy. And then it's the essence, the flavor. That's right. what I really love about right. sort of slow roasting tomatoes. Right. Yeah. So you have the flavor, all the Even water. this time of year. When Even this the... time of year. Yeah, it's important to find the best tomatoes you can. And to, instead of eating them raw, cook them, How roast them this time of year. You know what's very good, too? Wait, wait, wait. Hold on a second. What? The lentils. How long oh. have you cooked them? Um, we cooked them for about 20 minutes. These are French lentils. They cook really quickly. You mean not the biblical Egyptian lentils? About um, 20 minutes. Because you don't want to overcook them, right? No, you just want to cook them until they're al dente. Okay. All right. And since we have the tomatoes here, we're going to throw the tomatoes in. Right. And this also has carrots, uh, 
turnips and parsnips, which have been diced, and we've coated them with salt and pepper, and we've roasted those too. For how long? Uh, about 15 or 20 minutes uh -huh. um, for the turnips. The carrots are a little bit less, so they're tender. It's a great vegetarian dish. Huh? Nancy a lot really of flavor. Does, Nancy, Nancy truly loves uh, vegetables. vegetables. Uh, so now we're up to kasha. Kasha. Kasha needs to be coated with egg, or it just falls apart when you cook it. There's right. just no way to cook it without well, you ending up with mush. And, and you really want it, each kernel to be coated and to be tender. Have you, you ever tried it with just egg whites? No, I haven't. I've only done it with the whole egg. Over the AT, we make it with uh, just only the whites. egg whites. It's really? uh, fabulous. I also think you want it to coat it so that when you cook it, it yeah. gives a slight crunch. To right, exactly. But right. you get the same you get the same effect with the egg whites. Yeah, I would think so it's anybody, coated. so right. So anyone who likes to go in that direction do, do should you, not fear. Do you make kasha varnish? Oh, I love it. We make the best. I love the that. secret to kasha varnish, as, as far as I'm concerned, is about is having three times as much caramelized onion, onion as like anything you else. Say that, you, you, we have our kasha that we've cooked, and we're going to add that in. Did you put any salt and pepper on it? No, we're going to season the dish, so okay. we've just cooked it, just with the egg and, and water. And then we have caramelized onions. This was five cups of onions that we cooked down, okay. so you don't end up with much if you really right. cook them right. Smells good. Right. And you cook this in water, then, the kasha? Yes. Okay. And the lentils, too. Right. So we've gotten all this good stuff in here. We're going to add egg whites. Where are your egg whites? And some fresh thyme. Some okay. fresh herbs, a little It's like a mixture update. or something. Um, yeah. Fresh thyme. Fresh thyme? Yeah. Okay. And salt. A little bit of salt. God. A little pepper. A little red pepper. And mix it all together. And that's all that's, that's all that, that is. Oh, great. nope. We're going to add vegetable stock. Keeps it moist. Because okay. you've roasted those vegetables, you need to hydrate them again before you put it back in the oven. And we're going to mix this all together. Okay. Oh, eggplant. Oh, that's got to go in. in. When do we sell this? During uh, uh, Passover? We sell this um, year-round. It's a year-round great way to have an entree. Of Passover, you couldn't have any of this. Can't eat buckwheat ropes, oh, kasha right. for Passover. Right, okay. But this would be good for any time. This would actually be good as a main course at Hanukkah with a lot of different potato lockers. It would be nice. So all we're going to do is mix this together. Yeah. And we're going to bake it in a pan of 350 for about a half an hour, 40 Greased minutes. Pan. No, you know what the interesting thing about this really is, Joni, and I think I think this has this goes right to the heart of your program, right to the heart of your book. This is a very Jewish dish. We put it up in little aluminum containers. It's out there. It's vegetarian. Ninety-five percent of the people that are buying it are buying it because it's vegetarian, and not it's because good. not because it's Jewish, and not because anything. And and it's really, it's really, you know. Uh, bringing the old world roots of Judy of Jewish cooking right into into the present because it's good and it, it's, good. it's a wonderful vegetable dish. You said you cook this for how long? Uh, half an hour to forty minutes. Good. Yes, it tastes. That's a lot for you. It's an awful lot. It's, it's a very big portion. <laughs> you can take a dog back over, right? But you know the the uh, <laughs> you know probably. The, I would say the one ingredient of Jewish cooking that we haven't we haven't really talked about is right. eating off the other guy's plate. Right. That's I mean, I mean, everybody knows that that it always that yeah, everybody right. knows everybody knows that always that the, that's the stuff on the other person's plate. It always tastes better. <laughs> what we say about the dough, you know, the raw dough that falls on the floor, that makes the best bread. <laughs> so you know, but we, I, you know, I can, I'll taste this, and it won't be as good as yours. <laughs> right, exactly. Rosenzweig is one of Manhattan's leading chefs and restaurateurs. She takes traditional Jewish cooking to new and delicious heights. Sometimes I do grilled quail with uh, kasha and cabbage. Um, we also do matzo brai. And what we do is we, we change what we put in it um, with the season. So right now in the fall, we'll do some wild mushrooms. In the spring or summer, we'll do smoked salmon, or we'll cure our own salmon and do it with dill. Mm -hmm. um, and the real key to great matzo brai for me is that we do caramelized onions. We do a whole lot of caramelized onions. Uh -huh. And even if we do, if someone asks for absolutely plain matzo brai, um, and they're gonna, we'll, we'll serve it on the s some jelly on the side. Even having those uh, those onions in there makes it taste so good. 
uh -huh. and moist. Well, let's see what you do to make it more upscale. Okay. First, I start with um, the matzah. And I like to use a, a plain matzah, not an egg matzah. Mm -hmm. And I have some hot water. I like to do it in hot water. Let's see how. Yeah. Um, as, hot, warm, right? as hot as you can stand it. And what I do is just break it up, not too much. Just, whoops. And leave it in not very long. And basically what this is going to do is just get it so that when it gets to the egg, it will absorb as much of the egg as possible. And I try and get most of that water out. And I'll break it up a little bit more and put it into the bowl. But in other words, you don't soak it. Some people totally soak it in water. No, I just do it so it gets a little bit wet, so it gets warm, so it'll, well, just like making French toast, where you want to get the bread hard so it'll, it'll absorb a lot of the egg. And then we can put some egg in there. I don't know if you want to do that. Sure, break why the, not? Break the egg in there. Just one, or how many do you want to have in there? Um, we can put three in there. Great. I know when my mother-in-law makes matzo bry, she doesn't break the matzo at all. In fact, for her, it's a point of honor that her matzo retains its total shape. So she soaks it in cold water, slightly wrings it out, and then she coats it with egg, and she fries it. Right. So we're just going to beat up these eggs, make sure they absorb as much of the matzo absorbs as much of the egg as possible. See, in this way, you have a crunchier matzo bry. Yes, because what I like is I like to have s soft portions, and I do it in a really hot pan, so some of it gets a little bit, uh, little bit crunchy on the edges. I like that. Mm -hmm. Those onions smell so good. Want a taste of them? Absolutely. Mm, they're so flavorful and sweet. Mm, of course, purists would have cooked them in schmaltz, goose fat, and this in schmaltz. Right. But you're using butter. I guess less than purists would use vegetable oil. And now Anne's using butter. So we're just going to saute off these wild mushrooms, mm. which if you have a hot pan should go rather quickly. You don't want to cook them too long, right? No. So you can get, again, we just want to get the juices out. You want to get the juices going, a little bit of sweetness, a touch of crispiness. I know some of you, people that are probably going to ever watch this, will look at this and say, oh my God, this isn't pure at all, having mushrooms and matzo bry, but hey. And it's a great way to serve matzo bry for dinner. It's a great nutritious dinner that's very quick. Or a good brunch. Right. A little bit of salt. salt. Pepper. Tell me when you want the eggs. Okay. I'll mix them up a little for you. And it's practically a one-dish meal. That's what's mm. great. It smells so good. Okay, and I'm going to add the onions now. This is about um, one large onion. Uh -huh. My feeling is you can have enough caramelized onions. Mm -hmm. oh, look at the brown color looks so pretty. It looks really pretty with the orange of the mushroom. Mm -hmm. And you can use any kind of wild mushrooms that you want. You can even use domestic mushrooms. If you want. As long as they're not canned, right? As long fresh. as they're not canned and fresh. Thank okay. you. Now, there's an art to making this, too. You don't want to leave it set, right? You right. want to mix it up a little bit. You want to mix it up. Of course, there's some people that, again, like my mother-in-law, will not mix it at all. She wants it to be just the way it's set. I like to put a little salt in. More pepper. A little more pepper. And it's almost ready. I add a lot of fresh chopped parsley for color and for taste. And then I like to take preferences. Some people like their eggs very soft. Some people like them cooked all the way. So at this point, you can start. If you're feeding your family, you can say, who wants soft eggs? Till it's very hard, and basically, that is it. That we're ready wonderful. to we're ready to plate it. You have to eat it when it's very oh, hot. It looks very great. Hot. Okay, here we go. Mm. Mm. Anne Amernick has embraced tradition and made it easier. As one of Washington's foremost pastry chefs, 
she has perfected a recipe for strudel that takes an hour instead of a day. This is a much easier dough. It's a dough that's mixed and then chilled and then rolled out. So shall we start? We shall start. We've put the butter into the bowl, the melted butter, eight ounces, and then we're going to add the sour cream. Now it's important at this point when we mix these two together to make sure that they're really at room temperature. Okay, and why is that? The butter will seize up a little bit if it's um, too, cold. too cold. So mm -hmm. we want it to, sometimes we may have to even take this bowl and put, a little, put it in a little hot water bath just to, to make it right, but this should be fine. And again, just so that it will... We want it to be mixed and homogenized. And once that's done and it's all mixed and smooth, we're going to add our flour. Okay. Okay, what I do then is I'm going to turn this off. Lower the bowl, and okay. I thought I had a little more space on that other side to add this, yeah. but this will be fine. Okay. Okay. And then again, stir it. When you're done with this, after it's mixed, it forms a very unusual kind of a dough. Uh, people would, would look at it, and this is what, why it's good for people to see this, would think there's something wrong with it. It's just so unmixed. It looks like it's completely broken, I believe it would be the term for it, if you notice. But yet, this is absolutely the way it's supposed to look. Uh -huh. And then what we're going to do is chill this. We're going to, let's pour it out here so we can see it. All right. It looks broken and not terribly mixed, and that's the way it should look, because once it's been chilled and kneaded a little bit, it makes a wonderful dough. So we're going to chill okay. that. Okay, so we'll just refrigerate this. Correct. For an hour or overnight. And we have a chilled piece here. Okay, great. We're going to form it. What I do, because this is going to be rolled into a rectangular shape, I like to to form this into a log. And what's so funny, Joan, is that it's taken me all these years to figure this out. Okay, well, I'm gonna watch and learn from you. Yeah, I just finally thought, hey, what a good idea. Let's put this into a log shape and it'll make it easier to form our rectangle. So what we're gonna do is sprinkle a little flour on our surface. And what, what surface do you prefer? Whatever I, whatever I have. Obviously, a, a marble is, is the best, or a granite, whatever. Why? Well, it r retains the cold mm -hmm. uh, the best. Um, but if you don't have it, obviously, that's not a problem. Okay. okay, so let's go. So you have it in a rectangle. Yes. Now, you're going to see this one really retracts. Mm -hmm. And I like to roll this. This is why it's called strudel, is because I like to roll it really, really thin. So this takes a few minutes. Do you see how thin we're getting yeah, this? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, this could be, for all intents and purposes, now, of course, once I lift it up, it's probably retracted. Let's just see. Yes. Slightly. That's okay. Slightly. That's, that's okay. okay. Now. Okay, look, you can even see through it. That's what I want, that transparency. Now, we're going to take our, our apricot preserves. Mm -hmm. and we're going to spread it out over here. This gets ver done very, very uh, thin amount. There are times when I like to take the preserves and puree them in the food processor just so that I get a more uniform blend. But in this situation, it's fine this way because then it gives you some texture to the finished uh, strudel. Then I like to take a combination of raisins, mm -hmm. currants, cran dried cranberries. It's beautiful. Yes, it makes a, a wonderful mosaic on here. I have a tendency to go a little heavy-handed hap because I happen to love all the things in this. I think walnuts and raisins just are a wonderful flavor combination. I love it. So as, as you can see, I'm really going heavy on You know, here. as you're doing this, I know this is an American variation, but it looks very Eastern European with all the dried fruits, the jam, the nuts. Yes, and here we go with the nuts, and you see I've chopped those pretty finely filled in the spaces, filling in the spaces with all these nuts, going all around here. 
Okay, Joan, this is the part that you really have to pay attention to. We All want right. to focus on this very carefully because it does make a difference. Very difficult, but go on. We want to start by taking this edge, covering the filling like mm -hmm. that. Patting right. it down a little bit is fine. We're going to shift over to this side, do the same thing here, just a little bit. Mm -hmm. And this part, when it's baked, is the part you really want to eat, the okay. ends. Okay, good. Now, we're going to turn this over like this onto itself and begin the process of rolling this, this up into a nice, tight roll. And what's amazing about this dough, I find, is how, how, easily, how easy it is to deal with and how easily it rolls, even though it's even sticking slightly to the table. Do you see that? Right. And this is the part that's going to scare people. Okay, let's see what that is. Where and you, you don't have even to, have to put it underneath the cloth the way you do regular strudel. You might want to, I just never have. You just, without being afraid of it, you lift it and put it on there. And That's it. it. Right. You never should be afraid of your doughs. People are so afraid of them, they just get scared. Just lift it up. You're the boss. Mm -hmm. It's going to go into a 325 degree oven. It's going to bake until it's, I'd say, gold. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it could take a while. Um, and then... Uh, like 20 minutes, half an oh, hour? Oh, I'd say probably closer to 40 minutes. Okay. But it should be watched with anything. Again, the caveat is watch it. Make <laughs> sure you know your oven. Don't take it before it's ready. Right, because what will happen is if it's... This is rolled so thinly that even if it's undercooked slightly, because that's going to happen in the center of right. it, it's still going to be okay. And then once it comes out, the trick with this is, I find, is, is immediately cutting it. Uh -huh. So... Well, let's there get we this go. In the All oven. right, let's put it in the oven. I can't wait to taste it. You don't have to, Joan. Because I don't have to have taste it. <laughs> you don't have to wait. <laughs> because we actually have some. Oh, goody, goody. That has been baked and sliced. Right away. Right here. Yes. With a serrated knife? I start out by slicing with a serrated knife through it while it's really hot immediately. I don't even wait two seconds. I go right towards it and cut it. And once I've cut marked it and scored it down and cut through, then I take a plain edge knife and just cut the rest of the way. Mm -hmm. And then I get that perfect clean cut. And if you notice, if you look, you can see how flaky that dough is. It's a very flaky dough oh, and yeah, very thin. It's great. I find this can even freeze so beautifully. It even tastes better sometimes. It's mm -hmm. almost like a fruit cake that's had a time to right. age. Okay. Well, should we taste it? Certainly. Okay. You going to taste it too? I'm going to watch you taste it. <laughs> <laughs> You're trying to save the calories and just let me eat. Okay. Mm. Wonderful. It's good, isn't it? Mm hmm The more things change, the more they stay. If not the same, certainly just as good. Tradition. Tradition. To learn more about Jewish cooking in America with Joan Nathan, visit us online at www.pbs.org. Companion products for Jewish cooking in America, including Joan Nathan's updated cookbook, a CD of the music score, and a two-hour video of series highlights and recipes, are available by calling 1-800-235-3000. Credit cards are accepted. Jewish cooking in America with Joan Nathan is made possible by the Joseph S. and Diane H. Steinberg Charitable Trust, proud supporters of the arts, children's causes, and the preservation of Jewish heritage. And by Hebrew National, proud sponsors of Jewish Cooking in America, serving you and your family traditional kosher franks and delicatessen products since 1905. Hebrew National, we answer to a higher authority. And by Lenders Bagels, our idea of a perfect day is warm and comforting and satisfying all around. Lenders Bagels, the perfect circle. And by the following private individuals and family foundations.
This has been a co-production of Joan Nathan, Frappe Productions, and Maryland Public Television. This is PBS.